And a very good evening to you wherever you are. Welcome to Bible study. We've had a few little glitches that uh, are, well, par for the course in this uh, age of technology and we seek to overcome those. Uh, most important thing is not to get worked up about it, but rather to just keep plodding away and uh, realising that God is the one that we look to. And we're going to do that because we want the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Today, right at this very moment in uh, Poland, it's uh, a very special day because there is a march on of many of the survivors from the Holocaust. Today is Holocaust Rem uh, Remembrance Day and of course people have come not only from the Eastern European countries that are near Poland, uh, but mainly from Central Europe, Western Europe and even further afield. Those that have survived the death camps those that are the children or interested, committed people like ourselves who believe in God's purposes for Israel and they are converging on Auschwitz and other places too where atrocities were committed and God's people suffered so badly. We're going to look behind that to the reason for the terrible hatred, satanic hatred, and why... Satan put it into the hearts of so many people to do the despicable things they did, even the deliberate murder of six million Jews. Now, you've heard that all before, and rather than have that sigh of, oh no, here we go again, we want to go into the Scriptures. We want to see what God has to say. Does God have a purpose? Was he aware of the Holocaust. Well, we're going to pray and then we're going to really sally forth into this study, which I'm sure will be enlightening, it'll be challenging and comforting for those that are mourn. Remember that Jesus said, blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Father, bless your people Israel scattered throughout the nations, many of them home in Israel as you prophesied and as you decreed. Father, bless those many people that are on that great walk today of remembrance, whether it's in Auschwitz or the death camps, former death camps, or whether it's in synagogues or places of worship, we pray for your people, Israel, that they will be comforted according to the word of God and according to the grace of God, the mercy of God, that they might know the peace of God and your presence, your will and your purpose. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless our study. May it live in our hearts. Amen. Amen. Well, here we go. I want to remind you that Isaiah is principally divided into two. Ah, yes, I know there are many people that say, oh no, there are far more divisions than that. And that's true if you want to get intricate and very detailed. But principally, there are two divisions, chapter 1 through 39, and then chapter 40 to 66. Chapter 40 begins with those well-known, often quoted, and sung uh, words, Comfort, comfort ye my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed. I'm reading from the NIV. It's very insightful. That her hard surface service has been completed. That her sin has been atoned for or paid for. That she has received from the Lord hard or from his hand double for all her sins. A remarkable beginning 
to the rest of the book. And the book goes on to unveil the purposes of God prophetically for Israel. It certainly talks about her misdemeanors, her drifting away from the centrality of service and holiness before God as a people, and the subsequent and consequent judgment that comes. This is a tremendous portion of Scripture. But God wants Israel to know that he is comforting them because according to Jeremiah 29 and verse 11, and you'll remember this particular scripture and we can all quote it verbatim. Sadly, we can quote it and not understand the context. But the scripture says here, beautiful words, I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. I will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. Now we are going to apply the principle of dual application. And that is that certainly Jeremiah is talking about Babylon, but he's also speaking in a broader sense because remember he says here, I will gather you not only from the captivity, which was in Babylonia, but I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you. When you are reading privately the word of God and you come to these prophetic utterances, always be willing to look very, very keenly, very carefully and apply that principle of Bible interpretation, which is dual application. In this case, it's very clear. He's talking definitely about the exile to Babylon. He's talking also about a later time when Israel will be scattered among all the nations of the earth and be brought back. Now, <clears throat> remember Jesus. And Jesus, in the 23rd chapter of the book of Matthew, spoke with strong emphasis on the fact that Israel had wandered and squandered their calling. And he spoke to them time and time again in denunciation, particularly the princes and those that were in uh, control of uh, Israel, and there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven woes in chapter 23. It's the seven woes of Jesus. Woe to you, blind guides. Woe to you, teachers of the law. 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 He doesn't speak to the whole nation. He speaks to those that are custodian of the scriptures, who know the will of God, the purposes of God, the plan of God, the prophetic plan that God has ordained for his people, but they had sunk into a mire of lifeless, unrighteous religion. And so he said, consequently, the people were scattered, 
as sheep without true shepherds. And consequently, when Jesus comes to the brow of the hill of the Mount of Olives, we hear these words, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. They were gathered by the word of God. It's the word of God that garrisons and gathers our soul. That's why it's essential that, as Paul said to Timothy, we are preaching the word of God. You know, we have remarkable talents in our churches. We have wonderful singers and musicians. I'm a musician, so I appreciate that. I love the music of even the present time, and certainly when I was growing up, the wonderful hymns of the church, the songs that came in the charismatic uh, outpouring. And now, of course, many of the wonderful songs that people like Darlene Sheck and others, uh, Jeff Bullock, have composed. Wonderful, wonderful songs. But you know, we've got to be careful that we don't get caught up in the beauty, the grandeur, and the pleasure of music and the emotion that that brings about quite rightly, quite legitimately, we don't get caught up in that. This is what we get caught up in. It's the word of the living God. Wholesome doctrine. The whole book of Titus, just three chapters, is written to emphasize the need for godly, strong, wholesome, holy doctrine. That we might be, in the King James Version, subject to sound doctrine, so that we would be sound in the faith, and that we would be sound of speech. We wouldn't know what we are talking about. And when we declare to people about the Lord, the gospel that he has brought to us in himself, that we know how to articulate that gospel. And so we need to know the word of God. Now, the princes of Israel, the preachers or teachers of the law, had gotten away and they had certainly departed from teaching the word of God. And consequently, the people had strayed. And now they are ripe for a judgment. Now, the Bible tells us that Jesus wept over Jerusalem. Now, he wept because he could see that in the very near future, less than 50 years from this prophecy, that Jerusalem would be encircled by the Roman armies, it would be plundered, it would be destroyed, it would be a terrible, catastrophic attack. And over a million of its inhabitants throughout Israel would die. And he gives in the 24th chapter, as you already know, directions to believing people how to prepare against that day, what signs to look at, and to take notice of and act upon so they escape the terrible carnage of that invasion. How we need the Word of God. That's what you need. You need to know the Word of God. You need to know, I need to know, I need to soak in the Word of God until it becomes alive. And you know, the Bible in the book of Romans chapter uh, 3 mentions very clearly that Israel's whole being or reason for being was that they would be the custodian of the oracles of God. And we read these words as a result of the question in verse uh, 1 and 2. What advantage, 
says Paul, is there in being a Jew? What value is there in the circumcision, which was the distinction between Jew and Gentile? What is the reason? What is the uniqueness of Israel? Much in every way, he answers. First of all, they have been entrusted with the very words of God. Now, if you look at the King James Version, it says they have the oracles of God. What if some did not have faith? Will their lack of faith nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. Let God be true and every man a liar as it is written. He goes on to talk about the fact that Israel was raised up of God to be a nation of witness, a nation of worship, and a nation of influence. And of course, that influence in those days of Jesus had abated. They had no impact in the nations. In fact, the prophet said, we were told to prophesy and all we did was prophesy empty words, wind, and nothing, nothing was achieved. How tragic that is. When we go across to the ninth chapter of the book of Romans, we find here that uh, we have a number of things that Paul lists as the reason why Israel existed. Number one, remember the oracles of God, the knowledge of God, the word of God, the will of God, the purposes of God, placed in the holy scroll of God, presented to the people by the patriarchs, the psalmist, or psalmists, plural, and the prophets. And they, as a nation, were to treasure, esteem, hold to their hearts these wonderful, wonderful revelations of God, his will, his purpose, his plan, and everything that goes with it. In the ninth chapter, the Apostle Paul says of Israel these things, <clears throat> and it's simply of this. Theirs was the adoption as sons. You see, God took a people that were no people. And through Abraham, he caused them to be born. And he then led them uh, out, of his, uh, out of Egypt, and they became his sons and his daughters. Theirs is the adoption of sons. Theirs the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of Christ, who is God over all forever to be praised. Amen. So that was the plan and the purpose of God for Israel. But Israel sank time and time and time again into a slough, into a darkness, into a desolate state where the things of God became just form and formality and religion. Religion is having a form of godliness, but denying the intrinsic value of it. And so, as a result, God would severely deal with Israel as he promised, prophesied, in the 28th chapter of the book of Deuteronomy. We won't go there because it's a very, very devastating list of woes if they do not obey. And then, of course, Jesus talks about it. 
And of course, over a period of time, there was the chastening in Babylonia, there was the chastening in Assyria, there was the chastening and invasion by uh, the Greeks, there was the chastening of uh, the Roman rule, and then the ultimate was the scattering of Israel into the nations of the world. But we're going to go now back to one very important chapter in Jeremiah. Jeremiah talks about the fact of pending judgment. He talks about the terrible days that would come upon Israel. And he says, their days are coming because you were wicked. Chapter 16 of Jeremiah and verse 12, because you have behaved more wickedly than your fathers, see how each of you is following the stubbornness of his evil heart instead of obeying me. Well, of course, John's Gospel, chapter 1, 11 and 12 says of Jesus, he came unto his own and his own received him not. The ultimate revelation of God manifest through his son was rejected. And he was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief and rejected by his own people. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. So, verse 13 says, I will throw you out of this land, and into a land neither you nor your fathers have known, for I will show you no favor. However, there are days that are coming, declares the Lord, when men will no longer say, as surely as the Lord lives, who brought the Israelites up out of Egypt, but they will say, as surely as the Lord lives, who brought the Israelites up out of the land of the north, beginning with Babylon, and then out of all the countries where he banished them, for I will restore them to the land I gave to the forefathers. Isn't that incredible? So what he's saying here is that people are not going to be reminiscent and reminding themselves uh, only of Egypt and the great Passover and the great ingathering uh, and the bringing into the promised land. But he says they will also think and remind themselves and bless themselves with the fact that God who chastened them through 70 years in Babylon will remember that. But more so they will remember that God cast them out of the land, vomited them out of the land, one translation says, into all the nations of the earth, even on and beyond the lands of the north, even into all the countries where they were banished. And from there I will restore them to the land I gave to the forefathers. And that, of course, began in earnest when the modern state of Israel was declared in 1948. After two thousand years. And in that two thousand years that occurred, there was terrible suffering. And the culmin uh, culmination of that suffering was, of course, what we call the Holocaust, which we remember today all around the world. I don't know whether you did, but I know that many of those that love Israel and pray for Israel because Israel still is not totally prepared for the coming of Messiah, the second coming of the Lord as we see it, they're not ready. It's still proudly a secular nation that allows for religion, gives freedom of religion, but really as a nation, it is not a spiritual nation. Then he goes on to say here, 
I will send to them many fishermen, declares the Lord, and they will catch them. That means that God will send men and women, young people and older and more mature, they'll be sent into all the nations of the world to declare to Israel, wherever it's scattered, hey, come with us. We will facilitate. We will provide for you to go back into the land. And this will be a great second coming sign, the ingathering, the bringing back into the land. Now, at first, it will be through the positivity of Christians or believers who see this wonderful fulfillment of Scripture and want people to be included in it and to come home and to be part of the great ingathering and the purification that will take place because that's very essential. We don't talk much about that. There's the regathering and then there is the act of preparation, chastening, purification, preparation for the manifestation of the Lord as very clearly declared in the book of Zechariah. Here he goes on to say, first I will send positive people, loving people, people with a burden to pray, to share, to provide for those that are in the nations of the earth for them to come back into the promised land. But after that, there will come an end to the fisher people. After that, I will send for many hunters and they will hunt them down on every mountain and hill and from the crevices of the rocks. My eyes are on all their ways. They are not hidden from me, nor is their sin concealed from my eyes. I will repay them double for their wickedness and their sin because they have defiled my land with the lifeless forms of their vile images and have filled my inheritance with their detestable idols. So what is he saying here? He's saying that he is going to cause a terrible threat to come on Israel wherever it's scattered. In order to get Israel to mobilize and return to the land, those that won't listen to the Fisher ministries, like Operation Exodus or any others, the uh, International Christian Embassy, who provide so wonderfully for the uh, facilitating of, of scattered Israel to come back into the land. If people are still entrenched, still determined to stay where they are in the heathen lands, then there will arise in those lands terrible chastening, terrible judgments, and Israel will be targeted and they'll want to get out. They'll have to get out if they're going to survive. And that is happening as we speak tonight in Ukraine. There are still tens and tens of thousands of Jews in both Russia and Ukraine and eastern parts of Europe who are entrenched in those lands and say, well, why should we go back? Why, why, why? Why would we want to go back to Israel where it's uh, not always peaceful, where the Palestinian conflict and conflicts and threats from Syria and Iran are so real? Why would we want to go back to that? And what God is going to do and is doing at this moment, because already uh, approximately 30,000 Jews in Ukraine have begun to return to Israel. He will cause this terrible upheaval, this shocking carnage, this unfair and terrible war in Ukraine. He will send many of his people, Israel, to go back into the land, which Israel is saying to them, look, we will provide, come, come, come. And it's all here in the book 
of Jeremiah. It's in the book of Ezekiel. It's in the book of Zechariah. It's in the book of Isaiah. It's all through the scriptures. And then Jeremiah begins to pray, O oh Lord, my strength and my fortress, my refuge in time of distress. To you the nations will come from the ends of the earth and say, Our fathers possess nothing but false gods, worthless idols that did them no good. Do men make their own gods? Yes, but they are not gods. Therefore I will teach them. This time I will teach them my power and might. Then they will know that my name is the Lord. Whoa, wait a minute. Here is the impact of the glorious truth of God's word revealed to the Gentile nations. Amazing, isn't it? So it's not only Israel that will realize its folly, repent and return, but in the returning there will be a moving and working of the Spirit of God that will have impact just as originally desired and planned for by God. Amazing, isn't it? And that's it. Over there, as we said in the third chapter of the book of Romans, I read it to you before, I'm going to read it to you again, that given to Israel was the wonderful privilege of holding, treasuring, and they should have been declar declaring the word of God. Because it says here in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 3 of Romans, and that is that unto them were given or entrusted the very words of God, the oracles of God. Now let's go back to where we were, and we're going back to Isaiah now. Isaiah chapter 40 or thereabouts and onwards from there. Isaiah talks about the fact that Israel will go through a time where they are a very, very oppressed people. These are a people, he says, and I want you to know they are a people who have known the anger and chastening of God. Listen to what it says here. Um, these words, and it speaks about Israel as becoming deaf and blind. Their sensitivity to God, his will, his ways, himself, seems to have gone by the board. Hey, verse 18, chapter 42 of Isaiah. Hey, you deaf, look, you blind and see. Who is blind but my servant, and deaf like the messenger I send? Who is blind like the one committed to me, blind like the servant of the Lord? You have seen many things, have paid no attention. Your eyes are open, but you hear nothing. Now, let's stop there. Many times you'll hear people preaching that this verse 18 and verse 19 is speaking of Jesus, who is blind to every influence apart from the calling of God that he carries within his heart. He is not subject to the demands of the people that he ministers to. He is subject only to the will and purpose of the Father. He is blind to the demands of man and only open to the demands of God. Well, that's true because we're applying that principle of dual application. But then he goes on in the 20th verse about a blindness 
that Israel has. You have seen many things but have paid no attention. Your ears are open but you hear nothing. And it pleased the Lord for the sake of his righteousness to make his law great and glorious. But at that stage and on beyond that stage to the present time, but this is a people plundered and looted, all of them trapped in pits or hidden away in prisons. They have become plunder with no one to rescue them. They have been made loot with no one to say, restore or send them back. Now, <clears throat> I think if you know anything of the Holocaust, you will know that there were mass graves, pits, not only in the death camps, but in many, many towns, villages and cities in occupied Europe, Western Europe, Central Europe, and Eastern Europe. I remember once uh, when uh, Billy O and I were in a place called Poltava, a very, very pretty little town or city in central Ukraine. We'd been preaching in that morning meeting at the uh, local Pentecostal church. And afterwards, the pastor's wife said, well, look, we won't go back to our home. I mean, the home was so, <laughs> so small. Um, it was very, very small. I think the whole, the whole apartment that they lived in would have fitted into our studio here. And so uh, the pastor said, my wife has prepared food and we're going to go out into the gardens near where we have the service and we're going to have a picnic, which was lovely, lovely. Food was fresh, it was nice, fellowship was great. Anyway, we were sitting there talking about anything in general and nothing in particular, uh, just fellowshipping and relaxing and, and some old uh, member of the family was dozing under a tree and the children were playing. And they were running up and down dunes of uh, uh, covered with grass, beautiful place, be ornamental trees and very, very nice, um, quite nice gardens. And I just mentioned in passing to the pastor, Pastor Borodenko, I said to him, oh, this is a lovely park. And he said, hmm, yes, he said it is. He said, do you realize that under our feet where we're sitting and just further down here, there is a corridor of a mass grave of something like 18 to 20,000 slain Jews who were taken into pits and shot to death. Many of them were buried alive, not yet dead. And it reminded me of this terrible scripture, but this is a people plundered, Isaiah 42, verse 22, but this is a people plundered and looted, all of them trapped in pits or hidden away in death camps or prisons or becoming plunder with no one to rescue them. And that's what many a Jew felt, young, old and in between, when gathered together in the dead of night and transported for day after day, some of them never even being able to sit down and relax, but standing for days, exhausted, they arrived at a place where was to become their execution site. Now in about uh, two and a half weeks time, Billy O and I will enter the gates that they entered. We will walk along the rail tracks that they rode on. We will stand on the siding where Dr. Mengler and his maniacal, uh, horrible officers of the Nazi regime stood and selected to the left or to the right to live or to die. We will go into the gas chambers. I'm not quite sure whether I'm ready for that. And we will go to that and we will remember this scripture. 
how they were imprisoned in prison houses and nobody seemed to care. And that's why Israel and Jews around the world and those like ourselves who love uh, Israel and love Jewish people will remember sadly once a year and of course during the year this day of Holocaust uh, remembrance. Why? Because we remember not only their suffering, but we remember their isolation. We remember that they were left alone and very few were able to openly stand up. Oh yes, there were those righteous Gentiles who hid Jews, who championed them and protected them and fed them and made sure that they did survive the war. Some of those were found out and they themselves entered into prison camps as a judgment and a penalty for their bravery. But many, many, many were able to safeguard even friends of ours who we know very well who were kept hidden with false papers and made to appear as though they were just uh, ordinary Gentiles, even going to churches on a Sunday, going through the ritual uh, that they didn't fully understand, comprehend or believe, but they were saved and they survived. But by and large, the nations politically, just as we see today in Ukraine, by and large, there were not those that would rise up and say, you cannot do this. You will be brought to account for what you do. And it was only after 2,000 years and the awful carnage of the Holocaust that the nations in the United Nations agreed that the Zionists should be uh, listened to and should be appreciated and should be acted upon and so the modern state of Israel was formed in 1948. And of course uh, it hasn't been without uh, uh, criticism and opposition and even numbers of wars that have taken place. Here we listen to the word of God. Which of you will listen to this or pay close attention in the time to come? Now, that's why I'm sharing with you. I'm asking you, are you considering the whole counsel of God? Many believers will say, I love this book. I love this book. This is the book of God. This is the word of the living God. In these pages is the gospel of God. I have the principles that are eternal. Heaven and earth will pass away. My word will never pass away. And yet they don't understand it. They don't understand the plans that God has. How it has begun with Israel, continues with Israel, and then believing Israel and believing Gentiles become one new man together where in Christ there is neither Jew nor Gentile, bond or free, male or female, in the sense of our standing before God. But our standing before God is dependent on the receiving of Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. And he says here, nonetheless, you need to know and place, pay close attention in the time to come. And I want you to become an avid follower of the scripture so you know what's going on and you will understand something very, very keen. You need to understand and pay attention in the time to come of who handed Jacob over to become loot and Israel to the plunderers. Well, who did? Or you say, Adolf Hitler or Haman in Esther's day or Herod in Jesus' day. No, 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 no. We go beyond that. They were the instrumentalities of evil. 
conscious of and committed to the evil that they perpetrated. But the Bible tells me that behind it all was the dragon, the fallen Lucifer that once adored God and then wanted to be like him. He hates everything that God loves, has put his hand upon and ordained for glory. And so, because God loves Israel, Satan positions himself in front of her and desires to destroy her. How do I know that? Let us turn to the scriptures. And we turn to Revelation chapter 12. And here we have it set forth so plainly. He said, a great and glorious sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet. Oh, my goodness. And a crown of twin star, 12 stars on her head. And she was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. And then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads, ten horns, seven crowns on his head. He had tremendous power. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to earth. And the dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. Well, we know that happened under Herod. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter, and her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness or to the desert to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of for 1260 days. The Bible says there was a war in heaven and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought back. Who was this woman? Clothed with the Son of God's glory? Well, it was Israel. The 12 stars representative of the 12 nations of Israel. And who was the child? Well, it was none other than our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at the genealogy of Matthew chapter 1 and in Luke's gospel too. Have a look and see. You see, Israel gave birth to the Son of God. Oh, look, our time has gone. The Bible tells us that uh, this terrible dragon, this ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. And then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers, brothers who accuses them before our God day and night have been, has been hurled down. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. That's why Isaiah wants you and I to know all about the end times. He wants us to know what is going on, what's transpiring, what is going to be part of the end time. That's why he says, remember these things, O Jacob, for you are my servant 
That's in chapter 44. But let's go back to 42. And he says here these very important words. Which of you, which of you, because not everyone will, not everybody will be interested in even what I'm saying tonight. They'll say, oh, here comes Tony again on Israel. Oh, doesn't he know anything else? Mm, I do. But this is the word of the Lord. And the Bible says, which of you will listen, pay close attention in the time to come? Who handed Jacob over to become loot and Israel to the plunderers? Well, Matthew 23 says it was the Lord. He, he had to chasten Israel. But the terrible, twisted, darkened, emissaries of Satan went so far that indeed they committed eternal damning offense to God and towards his people. I've got so much more I want to say, but time has gotten away. So why don't we come back next week? In a fortnight's time, we will be actually on our way to London, where we will be with one of the great churches of the London uh, area at Southall and with Pastor Kyrian. Then in uh, a few days after that, or a couple of days after that, we will be uh, on our way and we will be walking in one of those death camps, Auschwitz. And I want to tell you that we will be praying. We will have some film of that. We will convey that to you through Facebook. We will let you know where we are. And we will take you on our journey. And then after that, we go up to the border of Ukraine. And I've been speaking to my beloved friend, Victor, tonight. He is a wonderful friend. A sacrificing worker. Goodness me. He works approximately 18 hours a day and he is ferrying people, bringing refugees, taking food across the border. And he said to us today, oh, I'll take you over to Ukraine. Well, I think mercifully we have to have visas and we haven't got those. So that's probably not going to happen. But I'll tell you what is going to happen. We're going to be there to encourage, to support to pray with pastors and church people and refugees, the children, the youth, people of all ages, some of whom will never be able to go back to their homes, some of whom have starved and so thankful for the food that you have sent by giving as you have. And we're going to bless these workers not just Victor, but others that we'll see and pastors that have taken people into their homes. We're going to bless them. And some of you have been most generous and kind and given us money so that we can say to them, and I said to Victor tonight, I said, brother, we're coming to bless you. We're not coming to take anything from you. We're coming to be a blessing. And I ask you that you'll pray for us. I'm asking you that you'll pray for them Brother Victor and other pastors, Pastor Anatoly, he is uh, the son of the former president of the Pentecostal Union. Pray for them as they minister, as they bring the word of God, as they bring food, as they bring water, as they bring uh, other things of a practical nature, medical supplies. Pray for them and pray for us that we will be a blessing and will be a benediction, and that God will pour out his spirit in the meetings that we hold in those places. We are going to be used of God. That's our desire. That's our plan. We need your support. We need you to help us. We need you to stand with us. That's how you can help us, by praying. And thank you to all of you who have given us. My heart breaks when I see day after day on Facebook the videos that I then post 
of the sacrifice. Today's video that came in from yesterday, yesterday was the potted road because of the mortar fire of the Russian troops, blowing up roads, blowing up innocent people in villages. So I'd go on and on and on as you would expect me to do, uh, so I'll stop. Father, bless, bless Victor tonight. Bless all those that are serving. Bless our wonderful friends all around the world, in America, in Sweden, Lord, even in Russia and Ukraine. Bless those in, in England, Australia, all around Australia. And I pray that you will give us a burden, not only for Ukrainian citizens, for the, the president, God keep him safe and his family, but also for the many Jewish people that are there feeling that they again are being hounded. Oh God, bless them, bless us all. Open our eyes. Lord, give us a hunger for your word. Give us a hunger for the truth of your word. Help us, Lord, to not only have an academic understanding in our head, but Lord, to have a response in our heart. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. See you again real soon.